Have you ever wondered? What does a C++ object really look like in memory? It's not as simple as just having member variables. For example, where exactly does the, this pointer point? Why does adding the virtual keyword change the size of an object? Where is the virtual function table located in memory? Why do multiple tables appear in the case of multiple inheritance? In today's video, we'll completely strip away syntactic sugar and OOP abstractions, lift the curtain on compiler internals, and examine the true memory layout of C++ objects from a memory perspective. Let's start with a basic class. There's no dispute about this code. On a 64-bit system, an int occupies four bytes with no additional overhead, so both x and y are four bytes each. Thus, using the sizeia function will return eight bytes for the size of struct A. In memory, x and y like two adjacent storage slots. Extremely straightforward. The key takeaway here is, without virtual functions or inheritance, an object's memory is just the direct concatenation of its member variables, with zero compiler magic involved. Now let's make a small modification, add a virtual function. Guess what the result of size if will be? The answer is usually 16 bytes. Why the sudden 8 byte increase? Because the compiler secretly inserts something into the object. A virtual table pointer. The memory layout now looks like what's shown on the screen. Here, we must clarify three easily confused key points. A virtual table pointer exists in every single object, not as a shared class level resource. If you create 10 instances of A, you get 10 distinct virtual table pointers. A virtual table pointer is essentially a pointer that points to a block of memory called the vtable, a table of function addresses which is typically stored in the read-only data section. The 4-byte padding at the end exists to satisfy memory alignment rules. On 64-bit systems, object sizes are usually multiples of 8, which avoids performance overhead when the CPU reads memory. From the above, we can see that the byte increase stems from the vtable, but what exactly is it? At its core, it's a lookup table generated by the compiler for classes with virtual functions. It's essentially an array storing function pointers, and it's typically placed in the program's read-only data section to prevent accidental modification. For the class AA above, its vtable looks like this. The object itself only stores a single pointer. Using this, we find the virtual table pointer, which in turn points us to the vtable, and then we can locate the address of the corresponding virtual function. So when you create an object P of class A and call foo function, here's what the CPU actually executes. First of all, retrieve the starting address of the object V uh, P. Secondly, read the first eight bytes at that address to get the virtual table pointer. Thirdly, use the virtual table pointer to find the start of the table. Fourthly, fetch the function address of foo from the first entry in the table. Finally, perform an indirect jump to execute the function. This is the true cost of virtual functions, one extra pointer indirection compared to regular functions, but it trades this cost for the flexibility of runtime polymorphism. This is a classic example of C++ zero overhead abstraction principle. You pay nothing if you don't use it, and only pay the necessary cost when you do. Next, let's introduce single inheritance and see how the layout changes. Under the Itanium C++ ABI, the most widely adopted C++ ABI standard, followed by GCC and Clang, the memory layout of class B looks like this. The base class A's subobject is directly embedded at the start of the B object. It's equivalent to B appending its own members after the base class A. In single inheritance, a B object has only one virtual table pointer because B's of table is simply an extended version of A's of table. Of course, if B overrides the foo function, the V table entry will be replaced with B's implementation. If B adds new virtual functions, their addresses are appended to the end of the V table. This explains why the type conversion shown on the screen is zero cost. Since the A subobject is located exactly at the start of the B object, the pointer P points directly to the object's beginning with no need for any address adjustment. Now we're entering the nightmare zone of C++ multiple inheritance. At this point, the memory layout of class C becomes a two-segment structure. There are three key facts hidden here, which are also the core challenges of multiple inheritance. Firstly, a C object has two virtual table pointers. The tables of A and B are independent and do not interfere with each other. Secondly, the base class subobjects of A and B are arranged side by side, not nested. Thirdly, pointers to different base classes point to different offset positions within the object. PA points to the object's starting address, the location of A's virtual table pointer. PB points to the location of B has virtual table pointer at an offset of 16 bytes. This is why multiple inheritance requires this pointer adjustment. When you call B's bar function via PB, the compiler automatically subtracts the offset from PB's address to correctly access the B subobject. This adjustment happens silently behind the scenes, but it's an inevitable requirement imposed by the memory layout. 
Let's take it one step further, virtual inheritance. This is the solution to the redundancy problem in diamond inheritance. The problem with diamond inheritance is that the base class A is duplicated in the derived class. The core idea of virtual inheritance is to ensure that only one instance of A exists in class D. However, this deduplication comes at a cost. The object layout of D undergoes a significant change. Classes B and C no longer directly contain the A subobject. Instead, each of them gets an additional virtual base class pointer. The A subobject is extracted and placed at the end of the object, becoming a shared resource for all virtually inherited classes. Accessing A colon colon A requires two levels of indirect addressing. Use the virtual base class pointer to locate the virtual base class offset table. Calculate the actual address of the A subobject using the offset table. Only then can the value of A be read. These are the costs of virtual inheritance. Larger object size due to the two additional virtual base class pointers. Slower access to virtual base class members because of the extra address calculation step. Increased compiler complexity needing to maintain the virtual base class offset tables. Therefore, virtual inheritance is not a silver bullet. It should only be used when you need to resolve diamond inheritance redundancy. Otherwise, it will only add unnecessary overhead. You might ask, why doesn't the compiler just design a random layout? For example, placing the virtual table pointer at the end of the object or keeping only one virtual table pointer in multiple inheritance. The answer is ABI, the application binary interface. An ABI is a set of binary level protocols that specify the memory layout of C++ objects, order of members, positions of virtual table pointer and virtual base class pointer padding rules, the structure of V tables, order of function pointers, inclusion of offset information, name mangling rules, for example, transforming void a column, column foo function into a special name. Function calling conventions, parameter stack order, this pointer passing method. The core goal of an ABI is simple, binary compatibility. If the ABI is unstable, libraries compiled with GCC cannot link with programs compiled with Clang. Programs that depend on a dynamic library will crash immediately after the library is updated. Compiled object files from different C++ files cannot be correctly linked into an executable program. So all these weird layouts you see today serve one single purpose, to ensure that different compilation units and different libraries can cooperate correctly at the binary level. The power of C++ does not lie in hiding low-level details. It lies in daring to expose these memory structures to you. If you truly want to write high-performance C++ code with predictable object layouts that align with the CPU and cache, you must understand what an object really looks like in memory. If today's content gave you new insights, please like and save this video. Feel free to share the pitfalls you've encountered with multiple inheritance or virtual inheritance in the comments section. See you in the next video.